Hey, hi, welcome readers, listeners, watchers. We are the Acid Left here with Rainer Radel and Vladan Jeremich from Belgrade. And we're going to read the next chapter in our installment of Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment, the culture industry chapter called The Culture Industry Enlightenment as Mass Deception. So probably the most relevant chapter to what we do as online producers, but also perhaps to today in general, even though it's a chapter written like in the 1940s, um, it has some kind of resonances with, with kind of um, online media production and what we do as broadly artists and political commentators online. So we're gonna look at that and unpack some of these themes with uh, our normal co-host Adam Ray Atkins and again as I say Raina and Vladan who are artists who engage with political issues uh, who are shown in many museums and and other spaces biennials etc and who have recently kind of moved into new media and have been making their own YouTube videos so that's a very interesting kind of transition partly perhaps out of necessity during the COVID period, but also just because I think they have their finger a little bit on the pulse and they're aware that uh, online is kind of a, an important uh, channel for communication of political ideas. So we're gonna basically start this by watching a video by Adam Ray Adkins, which he made, and he'll take us through a little bit why, he, why he's doing what he's doing. He's basically drawing, and I think the drawing he made is a response to the chapter, I guess. And yes. then we're going to watch then a chapter from Vladan and Reina, which is more a kind of um, video essay. And then we're going to talk around that for, for the rest of the program, kind of drawing out some themes of the dialectic of enlightenment and really applying them as far as possible to today and some kind of struggle for subjectivity and whether that's even possible in the classic sense uh, in an online culture. So I'm going to basically just start this with Adam's video here. Yeah. yeah so I, I, no, uh, one second. Well, do you want to say something about it first? Uh, you can start it while that's that's um, while I talk. That's fine. Uh, so I was just going to say I made this as kind of a response um, after reading the chapter a couple times and trying to really think about it and then do an automatic response to it to kind of try to highlight some of the stuff I saw in there and kind of reflect it back. And then I'm going to read a couple quotes while this is playing from the chapter that stood out to me. Um, I've collected those quotes, but then I'm going to kind of randomize them as I read them. Uh, and this is called Ritual and Industry. The standardized forms, it is claimed, were originally derived from the needs of the consumers. That is why they accepted with so little resistance. In reality, a cycle of manipulation and retroactive need is unifying the system ever more tightly. What is not mentioned is that the basis on which a technology is gaining power over society is the power of those whose economic position in society is the strongest. These adverse effects, however, should not be attributed to the internal laws of technology itself, but it's to its function within the economy today. Link those between A and B films, between short stories published in magazines, and different price segments do not so much reflect real differences as assist in the classification, organization, and identification of consumers. Something is provided so for everyone so that no one can escape. Difference are hammered, home, and propagated. Facebook, television aims at a synthesis of radio and film delayed only for as long as interested parties cannot agree. Such a synthesis with its unlimited possibilities promises to intensify the impoverishment of the aesthetic material so radically that the identity of all indus industrial cultural products still scantily disguised today will triumph openly tomorrow in a mocking fulfillment of Wagner's dream of the total artwork. Facebook? Although the operations of the mechanisms appear to be planned by those who supply the data, the culture industry, the planning is in fact imposed on the industry by the inertia of society. 
irrational despite all its rationalization. And its calamitous tendency in passing through the agencies of business takes on the shrewd intentionality peculiar to them. The familiar experience of the moviegoer who perceives the street outside as a continuation of the film he has just left, because the film seeks strictly to reproduce the world of everyday perception, has become the guideline of production. You could watch me on Twitch. I'll be live streaming my everyday life. The concept of genuine lifestyle becomes transparent in the culture industry as an aesthetic equivalent of power. The notion of style as a merely aesthetic regularity is a retrospective fantasy of romanticism, the unity of style not only of Christian Middle Ages, but of the Renaissance expressed the different structures of social coercion. In those periods, not the obscure experience of the subjects in which the universal was locked away, the great artists were never those whose works embodied the style in its least fractured most perfect form, but those who adopted the style as a rigor to set against the chaotic expression of suffering as a negative truth. This stiffened the backbone of art in its late phase against the verdict of supply and demand, heightened its resistance far beyond its actual degree of protection. In the market itself, the homage paid to not yet marketable artistic quality was converted into purchasing power so that repu reputable literary and musical publishers could support authors who's bought, who brought in little more than the respect of connoisseurs. Unending sameness also governs the relationship to the past. The purity of bourgeois art hypothesizes a realm of freedom contrasting to material praxis, was bought from the outset with the exclusion of the lower class. And art keeps faith with the same cause of that class, the true universal, precisely by freeing itself from the purpose of the false. Serious art has denied itself to those for whom the hardship and oppression of life makes a mockery of seriousness and who must be glad to use this time not spent at the production line, being supplied, being simply carried along. Light art has it accompanied autonomous art as its shadow. It is the social bad conscious of serious art. Entertainment is the prolongation of work under late capitalism. To the extent that cartoons do more custom, do more than accustom the senses to the new tempo, they hammer into every brain the old lesson that the continuous attrition, the breaking of all individual resistance, is the condition of life in that society. Donald Duck into cartoons and an unfortunate victim in real life receive their beatings so that the spectators can accuse themselves to theirs. Of course, genuine works of art were not sexual exhibitions either. Works of art are ascetic and shameless. The culture industry is pornographic and prudish. In wrong society, laughter is a sickness infecting happiness and drawing it into society's wholeness totalitary. Totally. Amusement, free from all restraint, would not only be opposite of art, but its complementary extreme. Amusement itself becomes an ideal. Entertainment has always borne the trace of commercial brashness, of sales talk, the element of blindness in the routine decision as to which song is to be hit, which extra a heroine is celebrated by ideology. The new ideology of the world is such as subject. Its exploits are the cult of the fact by describing bad existence with utmost exactitude in order to elevate it into the realm of facts. The ability to keep going at all becomes a justification for the blind continuation of the system to assist their positions. The emphasis on the heart of gold is society's way of admitting the suffering it creates. Everyone knows that they are helpless within the system and ideology must take account for this. Far from merely concealing the suffering and the cloak of impoverished com comradeship, the culture industry stakes its company pride on looking manfully in the eye, acknowledging it with unflinching composture. The posture of steadfast endurance justifies the world with its process, with its which makes necessary such is the world so hard yet therefore so wonderful so healthy 
so hard, so wonderful, so healthy. The liquidation of tragedy confirms the abolition of the individual. Against the will of those controlling it, technology has changed human beings from children into persons. But all such project progress of individuation has been at the expense of the individuality in whose name it took place, leaving behind nothing except the individual's determination to pursue their own purpose alone. The character is not new. It is the fact that art now dutifully admits to being a commodity, adjures its autonomy, and proudly takes its place among consumer goods. The, the dominant taste derives its ideal from the advertisement, from commodified beauty. The unity of the personality has been recognized as illusory since, Hamlet's, since Shakespeare's Hamlet. The culture industry can only manipulate individuality so successfully because the fractured nature of society has always been reproduced within it. The National Socialists knew that the broadcast gave their cause great stature as the printing press did to the Reformation. The Fuhrer's metaphysical charisma invented by the sociology of religion turned out finally to be merely the omnipresence of the radio address, which demonically parodies that of the divine spirit. The most intimate reactions of human beings have become so entirely reified, even to themselves, that the idea of anything peculiar to them survives only in the extreme abstraction. Personality means hardly more than dazzling white teeth and freedom from body odor and emotions. That is the triumph of advertising and the culture industry, the compulsive imitation by consumers of cultural commodities, which at the same time they recognize as false. Make sure to subscribe so you can have clean balls. And that's my, that's my reading. Um, we can continue watching this and discuss a little bit, if you please. Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, it just sounded, it sounded a lot like the experience of reading Adorno for yourself, in that it's kind of jumping around. But did you actually read it sequentially, or did you actually jump... Um, from did you actually skip some pages or paragraphs oh definitely i skipped oh, so quite a bit jumping around yeah okay well, then i couldn't tell entirely if you were jumping around or if that was just adorno jumping around no i was jumping around but it was stuff that i picked to jump to of course um reading it off the cuff like that uh if anyone goes back they'll probably notice a couple mispronounced words and stuff but i tried to just mm -hmm. trudge through that and kind of go on and connect them so yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, go to, ahead. It's not easy to pronounce Adorno's writing always, uh, or Adorno and Horkheimer. I feel bad if I don't mention Horkheimer. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, there were some interesting points. I mean, it, it got across a lot of themes. Um, is there anything you want to pick out particularly? Well, so I mean, I also added some stuff in there too, like just things that kind of came to mind while I was reading little notes I took on the side too, with the way that Facebook, um, social media, the internet age really changes and enhances a lot of what I saw the critique in here being. Um, but you know, the one of the things that really stuck out to me is where I talked about, or I mentioned it, um, we talked a little bit about it beforehand, Mike. The, so the talk in the last chapter where they criticize Nietzsche and talk about the morality where the, the justification of the weak and the strong is really brought up again in the second half of the culture industry, um, which I think is, I don't know, it actually makes it, made it make a lot more sense to me as well. And the way that, uh, through the culture industry presents the sick as truly deserving of it. They, they compare it to this joke that I guess was going on in Hitler's Germany, where everyone deserves food and shelter. Those who haven't achieved it can go to the concentration camp. Um, you know, and that's, God, that's a, it's really sick sounding and it really highlights what they were critiquing in Nietzsche earlier. Yeah, but I think also that's something to do with the 
they're talking about the culture industry and, and the kind of universalism of, um, of culture and, and how if you subscribe to the culture industry at all, then you have to kind of be okay with it. That there, there, there is no room to, to be complaining. Um, exactly. Which is something, they're not even saying that that's a mechanism of, of the output of the culture industry. It's not like there, there weren't uh, critical films. Um, like there, there is, he actually mentions, or Donna mentions it, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, Charlie Chaplin's uh, The Great Dictator. Um, that was from that period, it was 1940 it was made, and it was actually a very popular film when it came out. So clearly there were kind of critical films. You were allowed to say that you weren't okay with stuff. Um, but I mean, I suppose that film was about like Europe, not about America where, where it was made, but still, I mean, it's very critical, you know, of hierarchy as such, but this is the kind of thing that, you know, the, 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 there were even, you know, films and magazines, radio shows that kind of, um, that, that critiqued in a kind of tokenistic way. So that then you really couldn't express, uh, negativity towards the system because you had everything you had, like you know, the bad stuff, but you were also able to actually talk about it in America, particularly America and, and the democratic imperialist states as well. Um, so I guess that's the thing, it's like a trap, but also where they, where they, they, also, they say in the same chapter, Adorno and Horkheimer, they, they, they talk about um, anyone can potentially become famous um, that, or anyone can potentially win the dream holiday to Italy and it would be won preferably by some kind of secretary woman uh, who would be poor and it would, that would make kind of the system look really good. Um, but because anyone can win, you're kind of trapped by that. It creates an inertia that, that anyone potentially can become, you know, the American dream can become, can, can become rich and successful. Um, you know, this kind of like, it, it somehow has, has an effect of, of holding you in place. It's like in anticipation. And it's a bit like right. uh, Christianity, that anyone can go to heaven potentially, um, but you mustn't ask when, or you know, or, or why me, or why not me. Um, and also, I suppose communism had this same kind of thing, like there will be a utopia, uh, but it's kind of a transgression to expect the utopia to happen now. Um, I found that interesting. And I think both these things have parallels with social media, uh, with how we use the internet today, because we could say, well, you know, whatever Adorno and Hawkeye are talking about, they're talking about a top-down system, uh, which is run by um, by the elite, or the elite get uh, media kind of moguls and and the middle class to make content on their behalf. What well, happened during the the period of mass media, and if that's what they're complaining about, surely today we should say, well, hang on, we have like all this kind of choice more than ever. So it's no longer a top-down system. We can all express ourselves. Therefore, there shouldn't be this kind of inertia because we can say whatever we want um, and, and we can all become or it's more likely that we will win the holiday or have the kind of holiday or become rich or, or famous or whatever through Instagram or YouTube or you know, any, any one of these kind of um, platforms. Actually, it right. does, you know, in a way, it, kind of, it, 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 it gives us what we were missing in the, in the age of mass media, but it also exacerbates the the problem that Adorno and Horkheimer are talking about, that we were even more in a kind of situation of inertia and not being able to complain. Because what are we supposed to be complaining about? Because we can say whatever we want and, and we have more potential than ever before of becoming rich or famous. So I, I'm kind of torn between thinking, well, actually a lot of the critiques that Adorno is making are no longer relevant at all. And if you're still making them, then you need to really like get to grips and and and, maybe really look at some social media because a lot of academics who are dealing with Adornian analyses or Benjaminian analyses or Baudrillard or whatever, you think, well, hang on, maybe these people who are generally generation X or older, you know, they need to actually go on the internet because th th these kind of things are not applicable anymore. But on the other hand, I think, well, actually, uh, they kind of are applicable because all, you know, all the freedoms that are given with one hand are taken away mm -hmm with the other and and in similar ways that the elite were taking away our freedoms um through mass media yes absolutely because the critique is not only of the content it's of the form and that's like the part that's a little bit harder i think to understand um 
but is also deeper there. So like you're saying, our participation in the social media and all of that in internet culture, you you can't have that freedom that's offered there if you reject it. So being a part of it, you're complicit within it. Um, and I think like, so that's kind of highlighted, I think, in what they say about jazz. Um, I was actually expecting, I read this a long time ago, but I was expecting there to be more of a hatred of jazz in here for the way that everyone talks about it. But if <laughs> like the, the, the little bit that they say about it is critiquing the form of jazz where the syncopation in jazz leaves the whole of the form even stronger because it like reaffirms it by showing that you can just mess around with little bits of it here and there and leave the rest of it intact and it kind of makes it stronger like the fact that you can do a jazz version of mozart makes the form of mozart that much stronger also with the way that uh and and the jazz that they're talking about here is very commercial cultural industry jazz it's not like the free jazz of nightclubs and stuff like that the the way that Im improv solos were worked into jazz like there was a part where you improv you know and then how you improv you know it might be a little bit different than the traditional but it's still there within the same set of rules um of music i think that goes just into the way that it's about form and not only content itself so that's something that could appear uh uh critical or revolutionary even is actually reaffirming the very thing that it's fighting against maybe maybe if i if we can just add something it came on my mind while watching this what uh this video and uh, talking about this so i remember one very important sentence and also Adam was choosing this to, to read uh, and it was about the style and the sentence of uh, Dorna and Hork Horkheimer is that, uh, that, that actually um, in uh, culture industry there is no style. The style of culture industry is that there is no any style. So and this is very important to understand and also how you are connecting this with your drawing and the end you are framing everything with red with red frames and you try to you know to standardize all this what you have been drawing and uh, practically to show this repetition and uh, also that actually the style of uh, of cultural industry is actually to be framed to be framed by um, practically standardization and uh, therefore there is no style and uh, but uh, <laughs> It, it, it is interesting when it comes to jazz, as you actually, um, as you actually focus on, um, uh, as you actually are telling us, that how he is uh, basically, mm, uh, actually, there is no, um, there is no any um, uh, um, exception about the jazz in this, in this text. And uh, I was wondering myself why it's like that. While jazz is also becoming the same as everything else and so on, because there is some other potential in jazz, uh, as we learned uh, later on, some other political potential and some other things that maybe Adorno did not and Horkheimer did not notice. Vladan, you're absolutely spot on with the uh, the red framing there. I'm happy that that translated and you could pick that up. Um, and I think you're right that they, it's possible that they didn't notice some of that. And it's, um, you know, it's difficult to imagine, I think for us, the life and the culture industry that they were experiencing as well. Um, they, coming from kind of a high, a high place, um, uh, uh, you know, quite upper class there, um, they're looking at it differently than, than the average person experiencing media today. They're also talking about, you know, culture in the Hayes Code era of Hollywood, where things are super planned out, where um, radio and television and industry are 
very much linked like beyond just advertisements you know the direct product placement that was in shows the way that companies you know a soap company or an automobile manufacturer is at that time was involved in actually creating some of the programming itself um so the actual link in the their economic function there um you know like they give a little talk about the free the free orchestra you could hear on the radio that's constantly um interrupted with telling you this broadcast is brought to you without commercial interruption as a public service yet that radio broadcast is also paid for by these other companies you know so like that system in and of itself so that's another thing that they talk about is the way that each part of the system enforces the other it refers back to the other that uh the radio would be nothing without uh cinema and all you know and the other industries that are there so it's hard to think about them individually unless you're relating them back to the whole industry in which they you know when which they thrive in in which they're have an economic purpose for me this this sentence you you lined out uh, this uh, quotation like from nazi germany um it's a strong reminder that um, actually Horkheimer and adorno they were um having in mind their experience from nazi germany they were looking at at america and and i mean both um nazi germany and uh, and the american new deal they are both reaction to the to the big crisis and uh, it's really fascinating to see how uh, through this perspective they can in this actually rosy image of the welfare state in in the us they can see the weak points that's really really uh, amazing and they see structural similarities they are talking about this administered administered uh, society this is one of the their uh, idioms they are always uh, referring to so it's um, um, a structural approach actually to uh, to and uh, and an approach that is coming from their personal experience, I think this is getting very clear in this in this quotation. And uh, the fact uh, that uh, also in in this uh, welfare state, like American dream, democratic uh, society, uh, there is the same uh, structural. Um, uh, how you say force uh, um, uh, 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 a kind of enforcement of power um, that of course you can't uh, compare to uh, directly to 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 the uh, enforcement of power in in Nazi Germany, but they find the structural uh, similarities here. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a strong part of it. And, you know, it does seem to be the most personal sounding chapter so far in the book, um, mm -hmm. which that's that's an interesting observation. I didn't really think of it like that. But, yeah, that's a that makes a lot of sense. And I think from from there is also coming there. Um, 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 understanding um, uh, that. Uh, uh th th there is some kind of um um a stru structure imposed on the individual i mean for me this was a, i forgot about this uh, how how important for uh, adorno and Horkheimer, uh, the the uh, individual individual is actually they are looking through the individual um at at the society and and, and this was amazing to see for me and I also became conscious about how uh, actually at that time psycho 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 analysis, an analysis uh, was important um, for theoretical thinking. So it is linked to experience, to individual experience of the individual person. Uh, that was also interesting to to remember reading Adorno again. <laughs> 
I agree. Um, and the way that they talk about the individual experiencing um, identity through the culture industry here, like how a certain movie star has a lock of hair that falls in front of their eye in this accidental way, and then that accidental way can be reproduced over and over again so that the idea um, is for everyone to feel individual while you know imitating these other mass produced forms and then we look at you know the way that we're conditioned through social media to today i think that's it seems even like much more stronger than they could have even imagined because it does also feel like a personal choice you know um Absolutely. at the same time <laughs> I just want to come in there because actually this is something that, that you're dealing with in your video, uh, Radan and Raina. Uh, you really talk about uh, subjectivity and the individual and how this is formed and how there's really a threat to this that Adorno and Hawke kind of perceive, but the threat somehow has changed with social media. So I wonder if you just want to tell us a little bit about your, your video before we, before we now watch it. Uh, yes, it was a very nice and sunny day <laughs> and we were sitting outside having a coffee actually at the river and then Vladan uh, asked me, hey, have, tell me a little bit about Adorno, have you have been reading and uh, this is how, how, how we started the conversation. Yes, and then uh, I just want to I want to come in there because, as I said to Vladan uh, talking yesterday on Facebook, um, and that there is this line in in Jameson, uh, what's this book called? Late Marxism, the one the one that came out in the early nineties, where where Jameson says that um, the kind of impossibility of making art after Auschwitz, which Adorno obviously said a couple of in a couple of different essays, it's, it's impossible to make art after after the death camps he said the impossibility of making art after auschwitz has become the impossibility of reading adorno next to the pool next to the swimming pool so it's just funny that jameson said this and then there you are talking about adorno next to the pool um and actually one might say today there's the impossibility of talking about adorno um on a podcast <laughs> or, or you know <laughs> through online media but we're doing this as well. Uh, but anyway, yeah, please go on. Yes, and uh, then uh, Vladan started to draw. And this is mm. how, how the video emerged. So it was a very spontaneous, uh, spontaneous day, actually. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we, uh, we made like a two, two chapters of the video. Like one is, uh, the thesis of uh, Adorno and Hockheimer from the dialectic of enlightenment, especially focusing on the, on the chapter number two. And then there is a um, thesis of our thesis, like of reading uh, what is going on today. So they are like, uh, let's say, um, two chapters, two and chapters two, and two in, drawings. in 12 minutes video and two drawings, like First drawing is related more to uh, um, to the thesis of uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, and uh, it's we are thinking, let's say, very similar as Adam, uh, although we never coordinated about how to draw this. Uh, it is very interesting uh, that this happens, and uh, in the in the second in the second drawing, it is uh, more uh, how it is related to internet and to also to media today and uh, especially uh, when it comes to the radio and broadcasting which Adorno and Horkheimer were mentioning uh, in the time of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, and in the context of United States um, we can think today about uh, social media about Facebook and about Trumpism and also how this is affecting uh, the politics and society today so there is very, very strong, um, very strong um, parallel that we can think about. And uh, I also, um, I also, what I also find when I when I read uh, read it again is that 
there is a clear uh, structure of uh, like if, if you read the critique of their critique of uh, the culture and society you can feel that uh, Guy Debord's society of spectacle was actually um, very much uh, was very much um, not based but there is the same uh, tendency to criticize in the both of the texts although those texts are not related I don't believe that uh, Guy Debord was ever quoting Adorno and Horkheimer, Dialectic of Enlightenment, but if I'm wrong, but uh, I see the way how the sentences are made and also this idea to criticize it on that level, uh, thinking of uh, society as a whole, I see that in the second chapter very, very strong, but this is just my very whack thesis and I would like to to think more on that. Uh, for sure, there, there are some parallels. I mean, the, the kind of the basic formulation of, uh, of media being manipulated by the ruling elite to convey yeah. a message. I mean, that, that runs through many modernist um, kind of early media theorists. It's interesting though how Debord takes a very different approach. So he's very into um, using art to make very directly political statements. Whereas Adorno is quite against that. He's more into a kind of abstraction. But anyway, this, is, this would be going on to a completely different topic. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe we can pick it up another time. Um, but yes, yeah, interesting that they, 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 they kind of get the same, the critique, their critique is the same, uh, even while they come up with very different solutions. But yeah, let's watch the video now, your video. And then we can kind of unpack all of this afterwards. Da müssen wir erstmal schauen, was, was für Adorno und Torkheimer eigentlich die, die Kulturindustrie darstellt oder was, es, was da passiert in der, in der Kulturindustrie. Was passiert mit dem Individuum? Zunächst ist festzustellen, dass ähm, das Individuum entstanden ist aus der, aus der, aus der Tendenz, ähm, die die bürgerliche Gesellschaft äh, ermöglicht hat, die Emanzipation des Individuums. Also der Mensch wird praktisch zum Kind, zum Erwachsenen, zur Person, zur rechtlichen Person in der bürgerlichen Gesellschaft. Und, ähm, in der Aufklärung wird es begriffen als ähm, ja, die Emanzipation nach Kant, also von der, von der ähm, selbstverschuldeten Unmündigkeit. Das heißt, ähm, es besteht die Möglichkeit, dass das Individuum ähm, sich seiner selbst bewusst wird und zum kritischen Subjekt wird. Das ist die bürgerliche Idee vom, vom Individuum. Horkheimer und Adorno sehen jetzt in der Kulturindustrie, wie dieses Individuum, das ja jetzt ein autonomes Individuum ist, zusammenfällt mit, mit dem Ganzen. Also sie beobachten in der Kulturindustrie, dass die, die partikuläre Erscheinung und die äh, Idee von der Erscheinung, das Konzept, zusammenfällt. Also dass die, das äh, Universelle und ähm, das Partikuläre in eine Totalität hineingepresst wird. Die positive Realisierung von diesem Widerspruch zwischen, zwischen dem Subjekt und der Gesellschaft, dem Individuum und der Gesellschaft, das wäre ja eigentlich eine Utopie. Aber in Ihren Augen ist es eine falsche. Utopie. Also die falsche äh, Totalität ist hergestellt zwischen der, ähm, der, dem, der, der Kategorie oder dem, dem Ganzen, der, ähm, der Gesellschaft äh, und dem Individuum, dem Partikulären, ne, dem Konkreten. Äh, das ist wie, wie gesagt eine, eine falsche Realisierung dieser Idee für, für Adorno und Horkheimer. 
Sie beobachten, dass also die, die, das Individuum in dieser Industrie, in dieser Kulturindustrie, ja formatiert wird von, 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 dem, ähm, von dem Ganzen. Das heißt, dass ähm, eine Art Schema äh, verallgemeinert wird und sich gleichzeitig in dem Partikulären wiederholt. Die Produkte sind alle nach einem bestimmten Schema hergestellt nach einer bestimmten äh, äh, Machart, die auch technisch bedingt ist. Und äh, dadurch wird das Individuum eigentlich, oder diese Partikuläre dann, das einzelne Produkt wird gleich. Dem Subjekt wird die Möglichkeit genommen, dass äh, äh, das Subjekt in der, in der visuellen Erfahrung oder in, der, in, der, in, dem, in dem farbenfrohen Bild äh, zum Beispiel jetzt äh, eine, eine abstrakte Bedeutung generiert. Diese Möglichkeit wird genommen. Also die, das, der, der, das Subjekt, die aus den Einzelheiten jetzt einen Sinn heraus liest und praktisch aus dem Konkreten eine abstrakte Idee abstrahiert, durch die mithilfe derer das Subjekt dieses Kunstwerk jetzt versteht. Also diese Leistung vom Betrachter, ähm, diese abstrahierende Leistung, diese Verallgemeinerung aus den, aus den einzelnen äh, Details, die wird, äh, die, die wird dem Betrachter genommen. Die, diese, das heißt, der Betrachter wird zum, zum passiven äh, Konsument dieser, dieser, schematischen, dieser schematischen Produkte. Das ist die These von von Horkheimer und der Dorno. Und ähm, ich denke, heute ist ja die te technologische Entwicklung weiter. Und man kann eigentlich nicht mehr davon sprechen, dass, dass die, ähm, die, die, die kulturellen Produkte in der gleichen Weise äh, gleichförmig wären, wie, wie das Adorno und Horkheimer damals meinten, feststellen zu können. Also heute gibt es ja äh, zwischen den, in der Peer-to-Peer-Produktion -peer von, von Kultur über das Internet äh, werden ja sozusagen individuelle Mikro-Ideologien produziert von, äh, zwischen, zwischen einzelnen Produzenten, die äh, sich von dem Großen und Ganzen äh, durchaus auch äh, absetzen können. Also diese, diese äh, totale Framierung, dieses Framing ähm, ist, was die Inhalte betrifft, äh, nicht, mehr, äh, nicht mehr so gegeben, wie das, wie das damals war. Man, man kann sicherlich von der, von der äh, formalen äh, Schematisierung sprechen, die durch, die durch das Internetformat jetzt zum Beispiel gegeben ist, aber der Inhalt ähm, ist nicht äh, auf die Art wie damals äh, zentral ähm, kontrolliert. Und äh, deswegen würde ich heute davon sprechen, also um jetzt auf das äh, Individuum zurückzukommen, dass ähm, das Individuum sich heute in der äh, Lage befindet, dass es diese ähm, dass es in der Illusion lebt, dass die, die, die tatsächliche Realisierung des äh, Individuums äh, vonstatten gegangen ist. Ähm, also vielleicht ist es auch gar keine Illusion, vielleicht ist es auch tatsächlich so. Vielleicht sind wir jetzt äh, an dem Punkt, wo tatsächlich diese ähm, Individualisierung dieses, äh, dieses Individuum verwirklicht ist und sich reproduziert in diesen Tunnelrealitäten. Ähm, so dass man, dass man eigentlich von einem äh, Total Totalitarismus sprechen kann, ähm, der Individualität, äh, ohne das große Ganze. Ne? Das wäre eine äh, recht äh, ganz radikal andere äh, These. Jetzt. Ähm, also dass, dass wir in einer Welt leben, der, der Mikro, äh, 
nur, wo nur Mikrokosmos Kosmen bestehen. Also wo, wo nicht wie Adorno und Horkheimer meinten, Mikrokosmos und Makrokosmos zusammenfallen. Darin die Totalität besteht, sondern heute äh, leben wir in einer Diktatur der, der, des Individuums. Und <lacht> während bei Horkheimer und Adorno noch doch ein Widerspruch festzustellen ist, wenn man hört, wie sie darüber reden, äh, beispielsweise wie die, die ähm, also das, was sie äh, als Hochkultur, also die schöne Kü Künste äh, beschreiben, dass das nur in den, äh, in den staatlichen Institutionen und durch die durch die Förderung durch die staatlichen Institutionen möglich ist, also in den 60er, 50er Jahren, weil nur dort quasi dieser Freiraum erhalten werden kann, wo produziert wird außerhalb der, der, der kommerziellen Kulturproduktion, da wo also die, die so, sogenannte niedere, die, 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 die niedere Kultur produziert wird. Also ist in ihrem Konzept doch ein Widerspruch da noch auszumachen zwischen Ökonomie und Kommerz und, und den, den Institutionen der, 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 der Gesellschaft. Und da bin ich mir nicht sicher, ob diese, ob diese Trennung heute noch, ob diese Trennung heute, oder dieser Widerspruch heute noch ähm, auszumachen ist. Ja ob nicht alles eigentlich diesem, ähm, diesem äh, kommerziellen Apparat ähm, äh, untergeordnet ist. Und ähm, ja, wo, wo, kann dann, wo, wo kann dann überhaupt eine, eine, eine kritische Distanz jetzt äh, hergestellt werden? Wo kann, ähm, äh, wo, wo könnte jetzt diese Emanzipation des Individuums stattfinden? Und ähm, meine These ist, dass, ähm, die, dass die Entwicklung der künstlichen Intelligenz ein, sozusagen ein, äh, ein Spiegel sein könnte, dass dieses technologisch generierten Individuums, das wir heute haben, also ich spreche von einem technologisch generierten Individuum deswegen, weil die Medien, in erster Linie das Internet, also die, die sozialen Netzwerke, die Formatierung der Individuen verwirklicht haben, dass in der, in der Gegenüberstellung zwischen diesem technologisch generierten Individuum und der künstlichen, künstlichen Intelligenz, dass aus dieser Gegenüberstellung sich ein Individuum, was kein Individuum mehr ist, generieren könnte, eine Negation des Individuums, was, was in der Erkenntnis in der Selbsterkenntnis, in der künstlichen Intelligenz äh, äh, stattfinden könnte. In der künstlichen Intelligenz, also ein, äh, ein, ein Subjekt, das äh, allein aus, aus Kalkulation äh, hervorgeht, also aus, äh, aus äh, einem äh, numerisch aufgebauten System, in dem, in dem es keine Konzepte gibt, in dem es keine, keine Theorie gibt, in dem keine Zusammenhänge oder Verbindungen hergestellt werden, sondern also ein künstliches Individuum, das allein aus Anhäufungen von, von Daten besteht. Das ist die eigentliche Realisierung dieses Individuums, das Adorno und Horkheimer schon aufscheinen sehen, damals noch in der falschen Realisierung. Ich würde sagen, dass wir sind an der Schwelle, wo das äh, realisiert wird. Und ähm, meine Hoffnung ist, meine Hoffnung ist, dass der Mensch, das Subjekt in, die, in diese, dieser künstlichen Intelligenz dann ein, ähm, ein negatives Gegenüber erkennt und das, was mit Individualisierung gemeint ist, also dieses Verhältnis zwischen, 
zwischen der, der Ordnung und dem Partikulären, dem, dem, dem Detail, dass dieses Spannungsverhältnis wieder hergestellt werden kann. Und ich denke aber, dass der Begriff des Individuums dann nicht mehr für, diese, für dieses Subjekt zutreffen wird, sondern dass es anders gedacht wird, dass wir das anders denken müssen. Und dass es eine, eine Form der Überwindung des, des Individuums sein muss. Ich denke, die Menschheit muss sich von, dem, von diesem, der Vorstellung des Individuums emanzipieren in Richtung einer, eines Subjekts, was mehr umfasst als nur das Individuum. Just wondering, the thing is now I'm caught on the end thought really, and it's kind of like it's making me think of well, it's kind of making me really question what, what would be a post individual society or what you know what would be a desirable post individual society because I think sometimes we feel we're not in being individuals, but you seem to be pointing towards an in a kind of post individual that might be a good thing. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose this is, yeah, I can see your point because the, the individual is often seen as, as, as something that's very much linked to, <coughs> to neoliberalism. Uh, maybe you're thinking of like a more communitarian type society. But there I would say that, that Adorno and Horkheimer, and I already said it uh, towards the, the start of our talk, they really, uh, they, they really say that The problem isn't the, the media as such, it's the, it's the format of society, it's the hierarchy, it's a tendency towards hierarchy they're talking about in America, but they also talk in other points of the book about this being something that exists in fascist states as well. And we know they identified this also in, in communist states. So Adorno basically was saying that you know, this, this problem exists everywhere, it's, it's basically It's a tendency to identify that, that what he calls in English identity thinking, uh, that, that the human since, you know, forever ago, he kind of, he kind of goes back to primitive man. Um, they try and control nature by categorizing it and putting labels on it. And they do this through kind of like magical, then mythic, then religious processes. And then they get to to capitalism but that, that kind of comes out of the enlightenment period and scientific processes and, and the kind of idea of measuring things to categorize them and this kind of wards off the fear or danger of nature um so they see this happening everywhere and what adorno says at the beginning of this chapter is that it's that or he really says capitalism but we know that adorno isn't he's anti any system of domination so he's saying it's domination there's a problem it's not the tech um so um i think we could say the same today it's um it's not the tech that is kind of um pushing people into losing their individuality perhaps um it's the way we're using it and we could use it in different ways but actually just backtracking on that i just need to check are you saying that the internet is predominantly making continuing to make us lose our individuality or a sense that at some point you're saying maybe there's some potential in some sense it's it's, it's aiding the individual well, which one is it uh, you know i think that actually um i mean Horkheimer and Adorno, they have, uh, they have an idea of the individual which is uh, let's say positive Um, they see it still as uh, something that is, uh, of course, they know it's a product of uh, bourgeois society. It's a product of um, making a distance towards uh, the feudal uh, society where a subject in this legal sense was not existing. And sure, it's a product of uh, enlightenment. Uh, but they also say, I mean, um, the whole um, um, dialectic of enlightenment actually is about that. 
they also say enlightenment needs to be self-critical. But at that point, and this is how I, in a way, apply Adorno at, uh, and Horkheimer, at that point in time, they could not be critical towards the individ individual because they, they were uh, seeing um, the, the um, um, killing of individuality, uh, the killing also of the physical individual in the Nazi camps. So they could not be critical of the individual. They could not, because they were living at that, at that time. So they could not apply actually a critique of the individual. They could, but they already applied um, a critique of the, of the enlightenment. I mean, um, they, they talk about the borders, the limitations, of enlightenment, right? This is what they are doing with the, with the negative dialectics. And I try yeah, to, apply, yeah. to apply this actually on the individual um, because I think the individual today, I mean, I don't talk about the psychological individual, about the, you know. I talk about the a part of the, in the individual that is constructed by society, by the media, by Facebook. And we, we are, I think, um, uh, what is happening is that, that there is a split between the person, the person from flesh and the person, the, the profile on the internet. This is already one multiplication of the individual. And there is another, in the, uh, another uh, multiplication of the individual or the idea, the concept of the individual, if there is a concept at all, um, that, that would be the artificial intelligence. That means uh, a, a virtu virtual person that can, in a way, act uh, autonomous from, from other uh, uh, artificial intelligences and so on. So I think uh, that that there is happening something like a multiplication of the individual, individual, so we can't actually talk anymore about this like a singular um, thing, like one, one individual. There's, you know, there's several levels of <laughs> this physical person. Mm. Yeah, well, I think Adorno is saying that the, the, the individual didn't really exist because people, you know, that they were encouraged to express their individuality um, in the kind of late, late capitalist period. Uh, and they were really encouraged to believe they could express themselves and, and, and they could like, you know, they could be on TV or something and, and they could be on TV as them. But in actual fact, they could only be on TV as one of several kind of stereotypes because this is how you sell stuff. So capital kind of demands these stereotypes. And today, you know, we have much more freedom to express yourself as whatever you want to be. And there are all these categories emerging. And, and actually, um, ident identitarian politics, which is something different to Adorno's identity thinking, but what we call the identitarian politics, the politics around race, gender, orientation, etc. It kind of brings up so many kind of varied possibilities of who you can be. Uh, and we could then for, therefore kind of say, well, we're dealing with something very different. But again, it kind of reverts back into the Adornian analysis because actually you, you can't be all these different things. The, the internet requires that you fit into a category. The algorithm requires that you fit into a category because you may have X million tags you can put on your, your YouTube posts, but the algorithm can't deal with that many tags in, in terms of trying to assign your video to people. So ultimately you end up being, whilst you might think, okay, I can express myself today as a communist, an arco communist um, um, so, social democrat, democratic socialist, whatever. If you're an online leftist, and I, I really want to kind of try and apply this to, to what we do, because um, I guess that's kind of easy for me. Um, if you're an online leftist, you become a tanky or a, uh, a kind of leftist liberal or you become an identitarian, you become these very specific things. And then those things end up kind of doing battle online. So all this kind of feeling of like, hey, well, now we can express ourselves and be anything. You actually end up just being played off against each other. But very few identities end up being played off against each other. And that kind of 
these battles which are created online lead people to to get angry and to you know to to click more they say angry people click more um and then you create <laughs> more data you create more data for for the kind of online giants facebook google etc so it's all kind of it's all kind of very self defeating um it's something that i'm finding that you don't have to be very far left wing to end up being in a group of tankies tankies i.e communists soviet communist types um that that you are kind of pushed into that now an awful lot of my facebook posts about the left are full-on communist and i'm finding this across all platforms um there's not much room for an in-between and it's a big mistake to think well okay then this maybe brings us closer to communism because it's not any real kind of uh, communism it's, it's kind of an online caricature um so is again returning to what i was saying earlier that that whatever what is given to us with one hand is taken away with the other um but this is again it's not it's in no sense the internet which is doing this and all of us will recall um i'm trying to think how old we are um but i think we will all recall i'm particularly thinking of adam when i said that we particularly will recall the late 90s because he's younger than us um the late 90s and the great kind of enthusiasm, enthusiasm there was perhaps the mid 90s as well um for the kind of um theory forums for left-wing forums then the era of internet blogging um and then now on to to uh, left tube etc um but for this kind of feeling that so much could be achieved with the internet and you could bring people together you know across uh, the world who were leftists and in a way you kind of did see that happening um but now that's all been kind of very very well co-opted and, and um that kind of positivity disappears but it's not really the tech it's it's that the tech has been used uh for capitalist models and in, and even facebook when it was when it was founded there was no intention of this it was just mark zuckerberg making a kind of online thing uh, in his university so that people could like show their faces and you know it was like an online yearbook or whatever whatever you call it you have in this american system where everyone in the university would have their photo and a little bit written about them but it wasn't like hey let's dominate the world through this capitalist uh platform um but it's being kind of pushed that way by a ruling elite that need to use the internet in a certain way so where you say like um could the ai kind of bring us to a post individual um situation or society maybe it could but we would have to have the ai in the right hands uh, the algorithms in the right hands this is uh, the big thing um so i i don't leave it there but the other thing i would say is that this post individualism for me it just makes me think of kind of chinese tankies the kind of emergent um pro china left online and they would kind of say that there's a post individualism perhaps they would say emerging in china so what is meant by post individualism worries me a little bit that's just what i have to say well i i don't have uh, i don't have a clear concept of that. i i just think it is kind of the logical consequence uh, it just came out uh, from applying uh, adorno and hawkheimer's uh, dialectics in a way maybe i'm wrong maybe i was manipulating manipulating their their dialectics <laughs> I tried not to. I tried not to do that. Um, I mean that this mustn't mustn't be uh, something negative. Um, you know, it, if if we talk more, if we see uh, individual more connected to to the um, uh, consciousness, a consciousness which is uh, you know broader than only a, con a consciousness. Uh, reflecting only on, on, on your own um, so my point was more to make clear this um, for for the dialectics to, to be a driving force there must be this distance and i think people um, have to learn to relearn uh, to 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 make this critical distance and this is what adorno and horkheimer are doing uh, all, all the time, and uh, 
in the end, this is my point. Uh, um, I, I, this is kind of a, you know, a political move to, to, to make uh, 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 such kind of radical thesis, like about the post-individual, to, to induce uh, uh, reflection on, on, the, on the individual. This, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer were doing this actually with uh, putting into question the, the whole enlightenment. I mean, they say, uh, this is how I understand them, that enlightenment actually um, evolved in capitalism um, to, to, to a posit positivist um, stance. So that uh, positivistic approach has become um, um, dominant or he hegemon, let's say. And uh, they are very much criticizing this actually. In the background, there's a criticism of positivism. And uh, we, they, this is a very provo provocative um, thesis. I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of people also miss, uh, are misreading uh, Adorno that he's just repeating uh, and the, the idea of enlightenment. Uh, I think he's actually, this is a critique of, of, of enlightenment. Uh, he, he's calling us to rethink uh, rethink uh, what is enlightenment, to rethink also the individual. I think he's also calling to think what is the individual. Because he, um, he, he says it's a historical category. I think uh, he says it also in this chapter or in, I'm not sure, maybe also in the earlier chapters or introduction. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's really, uh, um, uh, it, it's a it's a consequent um, idea uh, to 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 criti to to make criticism to compare criticism of enlightenment to uh, uh, criticism of uh, the idea of in individual. Yeah, well, I, I guess he's saying that the enlightenment ended up exactly as he said he, he says actually in the beginning of, of the dialectic of enlightenment. It ends up reverting back into mythology, that yeah. the, where ah, the point of the yes. enlightenment is to stop yes. identifying things, is to get beyond this identity thinking. That because we we didn't we haven't actually thought a way beyond identity thinking, we just end up using the tools of the enlightenment to identify um, and categorize things. And I guess then you you identify individuals, which is what happens when when he's talking about the. The media industry and the possibility of really being an individual uh, and being always typecast a certain type of actor or singer um he's uh he's very much he's very much expressing that the, the the problem is that we we can't not identify um and, and i think i mean the thing is it really feels that he's getting towards something um quasi mystical um and this is something that he's accused of sometimes, it's kind of quasi-spiritualism, but he's never really strongly coming out for, um, shall we say, some kind of Buddhist nirvana or something. But then you wonder, what would it be if we weren't identifying, if we were no longer categorizing ourselves as subjects different from the natural object? Then if, the kind of, if our boundaries were effaced and we were no longer like subject, object, or me and this mobile phone and this computer and you know, whatever, um, if we're no longer doing that, what would happen to consciousness? And then I think your kind of post-individualism makes sense again, that a post-individual then would be a kind of eradication of our difference from, from nature and from each other. And this is, I think, what Adorno ultimately points to, but it's just made difficult because he, he doesn't really ever say that. So, yeah, I don't know. What, excuse me, what you just said there at the end, Mike, is what I was thinking, um, Rina and Vladana, I think what I thought y'all were getting um, with, I found it quite interesting, especially, um, what'd you say, Rina, that the, uh, the artificial intelligence would give the individual a negative to, to reflect upon. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and like exactly what that might look like. Um, yeah. 
Well, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, but still, I mean, sure. I was talking, I was talking with somebody who is uh, gener uh, uh, actually right now doing uh, research on how machines could, uh, could show emotions. And uh, he, he, he does research about that because uh, he thinks it would be important that artificial intelligence, it develops consciousness. So I'm, I'm very skeptical about that. And this is an art project, but, um, you know, I think um, that there could be uh, a kind of a concurrency between uh, the individual, uh, the individual that is created in the internet, uh, the, the, the individual, I mean, our digital surface, let's call it like that, our digital, uh, digital surface, like interface uh, uh, and uh, and um, artificial intelligence um, in in a way that uh, it's not really clear anymore if uh, if behind some agent in the internet uh, there is a real person uh, some assistant and so on you know we all know that this already there is a person or is it just uh, artificial intelligence behind so I could imagine a situation where you, you know, you get in love with some assistant uh, for, from your local uh, for, uh, for, uh, telephone company, and in the end, uh, you find out it's, in, it's uh, artificial intelligence behind. And I think at that point, uh, you will start to think uh, critical about um, um, the technology that is surrounding you. you you will start to you know you you, you will um people will 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 start to uh, differentiate differentiate themselves from these machines because you always want to be different you you know there's always this tendency of the people to to say i'm different or this that one is different so to recognize themselves actually they, this is this thesis about the othering, you know, the othering. So at the moment when you start to other the artificial intelligence, we might come to a new kind of um, uh, critical thinking. You know? <laughs> this is somehow what I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and I think, you know, not only when you're interacting online, you know, you might be interacting with a bot or something like that or some program that's, you know, meant to say certain things to you. But, you know, I think all of us are becoming more and more aware of how we ourselves are shaped by our interactions online um, through the different uses and abuses of algorithm, algorithmic technologies, um, such as like the, the way... So there's this like paranoid thought in a lot of people in the U.S. I'm sure it's worldwide. That's like, oh, my phone is listening to me. I, I had this conversation about this, and then all of a sudden, you know, the next day or a couple hours later, it was on my, it was being advertised to me. Um, and sure, that's a little scary to think about. But what seems to be more true, and I would say is much scarier, is actually that. There's algorithms that can figure out interest, um, and in some ways, they almost lead interest. Um, so that you know, in a very psychoanalytic way, it's like the your desires themselves are being controlled and manipulated. Um, and that sounds a little too personal because it's not a, it's not, um, it's not done in that way. It is a, it is an outgrowth of the system itself and the way that it functions. It's not like an intention to do that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, just from early advertising um, and the way that they used uh, psychology and psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis um, to create effective ads, what we're seeing now when you introduce algorithms there is much much more dangerous and can actually affect any individual themselves uh the longer you spend in online the more information is fed to those algorithms and the more they change to feed you what they think you would like um and in some ways like yeah predict what you would want um in a way that kind of cancels any true individuality any uh 
autonomy or any nobility. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, I think that that's something that we're becoming more aware of and maybe with an actual artificial intelligence could actually uh, become super aware of, which would make us question what we are, what the individual is, um, and kind of force us to look at that difference between our who we think we are, who our profile thinks it is, um, you know. I'm also also tempted here to think of like a world of autonomous profiles, um, which is not directly related, but I'm thinking about it like, what if all of our, uh, what if what if everyone's Facebook profile became conscience um, in some kind of way and started interacting without us? Uh, I think that's kind of frightening, but maybe it would be good because it's like, okay, it can do that stuff and we can go be human now. Um, also, though, I wanted to touch on, you know, we keep coming up with this, coming back to these ideas of how today we have so much more input um, and it's not this top down. Yet, let's look at YouTube. Uh, in YouTube, you know, you can upload anything you want. So TV is no longer dictated by these mega corporations. Yet, any like closer look at it shows you not only is there guidelines YouTube has, not only is YouTube, of course, run by ads and all of that, but there's ways to be popular on YouTube. If you watch like their YouTube studios, um, there's formulas and methods that if you conform to, you're not guaranteed, but you are much, much more likely to become successful as a content creator. That content, though, will probably be stripped of any remnant of uh, artistic, you know, value, um, or at least like in uh, artistic value in its transcendental sense. Um, you know, you're forced to follow the 10 minute guideline to curb content in order to fit. Uh, you know, um, acceptabilities to stay away from sensitive subjects. You know, there's certain subjects that we talk about on YouTube, you'll automatically be demonetized. So if you're trying to do this as any way of supporting yourself, you know, well, I'm not going to be able to talk about that. Um, you know, you know, I'm not going to be able to put out a four hour documentary about this thing that I want to do because it's not going to get you the hits. It's not going to get you the clicks. Um, and then like Mike said, with uh, people that angry people click more is also taken into account. You know, the more that you interact online and the more that uh, the angry clicks feed into it, the more that you might be tempted, even unconsciously, to create the kind of content that would generate those those responses, right? Um, and which pushes us into those micro um, microcosms of ideologies, the reality tunnels, like y'all were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that the issue there is that that the system cannot survive without categories and experts. So the, the algorithms kind of become the expert that that kind of deems something to be worthy, but also it's actually making experts of us or, or making us um uh kind of categorize ourselves or or there's kind of a strong there's a strong feeling that a lot of people online who identify as leftists that, that they've become very kind of like discerning but discerning is not really the best word but more maybe preoccupied with with who they're mixing with and and whether who they're talking with is expressing the right opinion, the, the opinion that's going to go down well in their corner of the internet. So it's kind of making us all into experts to self-regulate the system to make sure that certain kind of very clearly defined content is, is, is uh, being produced because it's only the clearly defined that can, can meet an audience. So the problem with the four-hour documentary on um, insect life or something on, the, on YouTube is that um, it's not going to fit into the right niche and that that's all that the capitalism really cares about. It's not really caring that you're anti-capitalist because actually they're obviously permitting a lot of anti-capitalist content so long as it's making people click uh, and, and kind of keep interacting. So the, 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 kind of the, the category of the tanky is one that's become 
kind of useful. And so I have this meme here, which I actually, I kind of found, I made it a couple of years ago, but I, I changed it. It did say left, leftist meme bros. Now it says tanky meme bros. Um, and they're kind of like, you know, they're, they're, they'll say anything. And I actually put it on Instagram. I said, like, the tanky will say, like, you know, don't vote. Uh, don't vote in the election because I'm going to make a revolution. But do I look okay in this? You know, so they, they're keeping doing this. They're keeping getting, they, 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 I think the thing is to be a, to be a tanky or even a leftist with a chance of, of having a following today, you need to say something quite radical. So they're saying all this radical stuff. They're saying don't vote when clearly to a lot of leftist friends I have who are, I would say left to center, the only thing that makes sense in America right now is voting for Biden. And they all know that Biden is really terrible. But then you will get a tanky saying, no, no, wait, because we're going to make a revolution. But then, you know, they're really doing that for effect. They want to, they want to, they want to, they're caring about how they come across, you know, by saying that. It's like, it's easy to get kudos. Um, it's easy to get, to look cool saying the most revolutionary thing online, but it's not going to make uh, an actual revolution happen. It's, a, it's actually taking us away from that happening because people are just like, really like, they're kind of saying, how does my ass look in this? But they're really saying like, you know, how does my communism look in this? Um, how, how are my communist credentials today? And um, this, is all, this is all coming out of the internet, but we, I think we've kind of said this in different ways, in a few different ways, but th this, these are the tunnels that are being created. Um, and it makes me get quite angry actually, because the radicals now are not really the people expressing as radical. Um, that's like a fashion. The radicals often are being a bit more intelligent because the radicals really want a revolution. So then you have to be like, ah, oh, well, hang on, let's have a little think about this. How are we actually going to make this happen? Not just sounding off online. So you end up talking about Adorno for an hour and a half, which you don't do. <laughs> you don't do if you're in a tanky crowd, if you're in the cooler crowds of the online left, because that makes you a libtard. You know, because, because like you know, Adorno himself is is has a big image problem with the left anyway. But I think it's coming back with, with a tanky crowd because he wouldn't endorse his student revolution, his student uprising. He called cops um, on people for flashing him. Come on. Yeah. He's cancelled. Sorry, Adorno's cancelled. Yeah. I mean, then I don't know if he really could, if he called the cops on that particular lecture when the student female students flashed him. I don't know, if, or if he called the cops at a different point. Um, but it was a revolution for him, destined to to turn into a totalitarianism. That he wasn't enough worked out yet because we were still identity thinking. We were still thinking through identifying. Um, for me, that's kind of sensible. But I don't know. I mean, I think Adorno, you have to be careful because there's every chance he was just being. Um, making the wrong decision because he was an aristocrat. Um, and not that it makes someone make wrong decisions, but I mean, he, some of the things he says, like you can't really defend and you do wonder uh, whether he was just wrong. And yeah, it's very, the, what's happening with students, I think, is very complex. And to really understand it, you probably need to be reading, what, what was his student called? The, the one that, the one of the biggest rebel who, he, 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 he was, he was um, doing a PhD with Adorno. I forget his name now, but you can only read him in German. Um, but there's a whole lot of stuff um, there that you could unpack. But I, I don't know that Donna should be completely defended in that instance or not. Um, it's hard. But I do know that his students probably wouldn't have created, you know, the revolution we, we want to see. Um, and I, I kind of get what he was saying, was like, let's hold off until we can actually do something that, that, that makes sense. Or, or, you know, in any case... The the arm the, the, the armaments the um the the gear that the the that Germany had to suppress a potential revolution, you know, it, it was at that point it was that that point not worth trying an armed revolution or a literal seizure of power, and um, you couldn't in France in sixty eight either. It was basically that it, it excited to crumble the the uprisings when de Gaulle amassed um, troops around the perimeter of France of France, of, um, of Paris. Um, and then today, when you look at the, you look at the odds, you know, whether, whether or not one could have an armed uprising, I mean, it's just like a uh, cloud cuckoo land. It's not, it's not possible. Uh, but this is, these are the terms in, in which tankies are talking. They're really online. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're really kind of play, play acting that they're going to make a revolution. And, you know, 
I find it kind of uh, distracting and not helpful. But I don't know, because maybe Vladan, you might think something completely that, you know, you may be more radical than me in that sense. You're, you're muted. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the problem um, with, uh, because like, for example, left discourse in the social media, is uh, going into let's say tanky direction or in some other direction it doesn't mean that uh, all those people are politically conscious or that they are uh, politically aware of uh, this so there is uh, i would say there is this strong separation between um between real political practice which can be like completely passive average uh, uh, nobody, practically people who are not even voting or something, and these avatars, like this uh, social media presence, uh, which goes into some kind of radical uh, radicalism and feeding actually the feeding the political uh, the political um, subjects which are like a player in the political arena. So I think there is a there is a strong dissonance between uh, all those fields when it comes to politics and when it comes to political expression uh, of, uh, of, of different, uh, different uh, let's say, uh, appearances in social media or in media itself. And, uh, I, you know, there is, a, there is very interesting, uh, like when I think about the time of Nazi Germany, and when radio appears, I think what is the difference between radio and broadcasting in that time was that it was not so uh, longitudinal. Uh, it was uh, not durational. And um, it was, you know, appearing, um, let's say, one hour per day. It was very strong. It was sending a very, uh, very precise message. And this message had a strong impact because uh, people were uh, not, uh, not, people were like still uh, not so, they, they were not, not used to it. So it had, it had a strong impact and short impact. It was like a shooting. Ah, ah, you know. And what we have now, like what we have now, if you call compare these two, um, two strategies or two, those two impacts is that actually we have today that people are uh, symbiotically related or symbiotically um, using it like um, on the long term. Like it's uh, 20, since some people are using this uh, uh, since 10 years and uh, since even 20 years, like, you know, um, we, we used to make uh, uh, MP edge, MPG videos, like uh, short video clips, and we, 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 are, we, are, we are putting these uh, short clips online as a files. Uh, it was in the beginning of 2000s, Ren and me, and we have been sharing these videos on mailing lists. So this was the, um, this was the time when this was possible. And then you had to download the file and then you watch the video. But this was before YouTube, before the YouTube. So, um, so I can say that we are actually, you know, using this since 20 years in a way. And uh, the problem is if you are not able to distinct those two realities in a certain moment, you know, in a certain um, political um, situation or in a certain social um, uh, social, uh, let's say, um, uh, structure or um, real economic and uh, social and political conditions, you don't get it, you know, like you, you practically have some kind of uh, disconnection of reality and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this appearance on, on social media. And I think um, the problem is what I said that most of the content are um, depoliticized, even when it comes to radical political uh, statements, messages, memes. 
so they uh, they they become flat in a way. Uh, but this does not need to. This doesn't uh, mean that they cannot activate in the extreme right or extremist way in, at a certain moment. So they are. They can be dangerous. They can be activated dangerous, but um, uh, they are just floating. So we have, uh, let's say, floating um, Nazis. Yeah, but this is the nature of the, of the extreme right as opposed to the extreme left, though. That the, 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 there is this kind of, should say, float, floating or sleeping potential actors that that will carry yeah. out an act. Um, but there's no equivalent on the left for somebody who would potentially just suddenly um, try and assassinate, uh, you know, a capitalist uh, a Western leader or any leader. Um, and that anyway, wouldn't, it wouldn't achieve our aims. I mean, it's partly the issue that the aims are very different, I suppose. Um, but there is a certain kind of part of the right that, that, that would see the, the violence against foreigners or something or a leftist opponent as an end in itself. Whereas the left doesn't really have an equivalent of that, that there isn't really this idea of a symbolic victory that, that somehow progresses our, our cause. Um, I mean, there have been in different points of history and in different, in different uh, societies, there's been kind of political assassinations that might be seen as something better than themselves. I mean, I think it's probably a good thing that that, that, that doesn't really exist in the, within the left at the moment um, in our circles. Um, well, but, I think yeah, yeah, capitalism gets us away from that in a lot of senses. Like in under, um, you know, a uh, uh, monarchy, it makes sense a little bit. You know, like killing the king um, is is definitely a symbolic and important act that could completely change that. Though, you know, you could say today that you could, yeah, you could uh, guillotine half half of the. Uh, fortune 500 list or whatever or the big capitalists of today and we're still left with the same same system you know that's not gonna change that uh and i think that's i guess what adorno saw in the the totalitarian aspect of the of those yeah protests, but, this you is, know? but this is interesting because it means that the kind of the paralleling of right-wing forum action online and right-wing memeing with a left-wing equivalent that's just as aggressive in some ways is useless because it's not actually that that, that we're aiming towards anyway that that the right-wing version which can re result in charlottesville for example um you know having an equivalent in the left doesn't really make sense because what you're actually looking to do in the left is to create a mass movement that requires something right. completely different requires a cohesion a reaching out and being somehow peaceful and um, n not being fundamentally violent in your in your imagery which I right you you want to put a class consciousness in those people because many of those people you know theoretically yeah but this um, absolutely but this is what requires talking to those people but it's like hello you know is anyone is anyone on the left that we know online um around the groups we know are they going and talking to workers they don't know any workers probably you know a lot a lot of them won't know any workers um so you know this is it's kind of just quite sad really I, I, and i think there needs to be structures where whereby you can lead online leftists people who are very young impressionable getting into the left online lead them into community work and community building somehow we're not saying that i've actually ever achieved that i mean i do try and do now a little bit of political on the ground work and I, I'm, I'm involved in electoral politics now so it's kind of the worst the worst of the worst for the far left um but you know i think this is what we should be trying to do i'm not saying we should be all be involved in electoralism um but pushing some kind of actual involvement with workers or you know forms of communication that appeal to 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 workers you know which, I, which we're not very successful in doing uh i don't think yeah of course but there are there are some uh, people who are uh, like uh, communicating with workers and have uh and have also successful media campaigns um and also they are, have presence on internet but they are mostly like uh, related to 
the problems of workers. So they are uh, they are like uh, Facebook groups, textile which industry. are for for example related to the problems of workers in textile industry or uh, people who are who have troubles with uh, legal issues uh, related to their debts. So like and the people are I mean I know that those groups are. Um, 25, 50,000 people, you know, like most of them workers who suffer from, uh, from, from this capitalist realism. Uh, and, uh, but they don't care about, uh, about memes or about other discussions. So it's mostly related to their problems. And this is, I would say, some kind of self-help groups. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not a group where you have some kind of uh, discussion about about class consciousness because uh, people are uh, you know people who suffer from this uh, structural oppression and uh, who suffer from uh, all these problems uh, in which they are they are uh, rather um, looking to solve the basic problem they have so they don't have time and they feel like completely um, yeah this is true yeah. That's the problem. That's the biggest problem. But I think like, this is like, how, how does one then communicate with them? You say you go to work in Starbucks, you sell 50 coffees and that pays for your wage for the day. But then you have to stay and sell another 100 coffees to make money for your boss. This is a simple way of describing things. Um, this is capitalism. Uh, that's not really fair. You know, if people had things put to them like that maybe um they they might begin to understand who the real enemy is uh, rather than blaming everything on 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 immigrants uh, or some imaginary kind of far left uh which don't really exist in big numbers i mean we we possibly could benefit from having like a lot of capital and other kind of important left text put into very simple terms like this um and why not? Why not then take that to these groups and try and communicate? Then they might throw rotten tomatoes at us or whatever. Um, you know, they might not like us, but then, you know, then we've tried that. Um, I just, you know, I, do, I just think that that's the direction we should be going in. I'm not saying I'm doing it very well or very much. Um, well, I, I agree with you there, Mike. I think also, um, and this would maybe be against Adorno um, or going going away from a little bit. I think also you need to offer something for people to envision that is more because, you know, a lot of people know that they're in a shit situation, right? Like a lot of workers that are working crappy jobs know it's crappy. They just think, well, that's life, you know, I mean, I do a little bit of this and then I can go home and, you know, on the, I, I can watch TV on the weekend. I can go to the lake and get a ski do or whatever. Um, they accept that suffering um, of work itself, you know, um, because they can't really see anything beyond that. There's not institutional powers um, such as workers parties, uh, you know, that existed in the past that could offer them that. So you have to get it from somewhere else. Otherwise the situation just looks bleak. Um, and I think that's something that we, we've been continually trying to do um, just like we're continually trying to do what you were just saying as well. Um, I think they have to be combined. And I guess that's where art art comes in. Um, yeah, I think art is, is for sure relevant and can, can play a part. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we're coming up to to wrapping up, um, and I wonder if anyone has any kind of comments. Uh, I mean, how would we pull this together? Um, I think what we what we're saying is overall that there, because there's a new form of media, there needs to be a new way of looking at what that media can achieve and, and what it's doing negatively and what it can do positively in terms of uh, forming the subject, the individual. And the quite definitely things have changed such that it's not it's not sure how how desirable the individual is, what format the individual should take, and and then you know we need to work all this out. But then within all that, 
we have roles as creative people, um, people associated with the left, and we need to work out how best to use this potential we have. And I think in that respect, I mean, for me, I, I feel a little bit, um, I would say happy, but it's not very like, <laughs> not very Adornian, but I mean, I feel, you know, I feel kind of some extent positive that we have all this stuff, all these ways of expressing ourselves. And certainly, you know, Adorno and Benjamin, et cetera, both we are even that much later on, um, you know, they're, they, they didn't have this potential. And, and, and uh, I wonder, you know, what, what they would have done with it, but, you know, we have it and we can, we can try and think ways of making this uh, somehow useful. Anyone? That's a big gap. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I mean, I think that uh, actually what we are doing now, I, I was just uh, thinking uh, back in the 90s, I, I remember we were discussing how, how it could be possible that a lot of people work on the same thing through internet. This was kind of a social utopia and also cr in terms of art, like uh, to have a means to collaborate uh, with a lot of people on one thing through the internet. This was the idea that we had about the internet. And in a way, we, we have arrived there. And I, I think, uh, of course, we all know that this is uh, possible only through capitalism. This is all only possible through Google and Zoom, and the, uh, it's all cooperative um, frame we have to use. Uh, but uh, uh, still, uh, there is a chance to connect, and that's um, that's a um, very positive thing. And this is where we can use the technique, even if it's in the hands of the of capital. There is a certain potential in in this uh, interconnection between people that are apart, because I think that uh, uh, we are going into a class society that will be a, a kind of a global class society. So not national states with the classes within the national states, but the global uh, um, uh, work, worker, working class, global working class, you know, like for example, programmers, um, uh, a global class, a uh, global elite, and so on. This is all going to be globalized, and uh, and actually, the internet is the only way to to uh, get people uh, together on certain issues uh, around the globe. So there, there is no uh, no yeah. other chance. <laughs> and um, while there is uh, this, uh, while there are restrictions on nation states uh, related to. Uh, uh, pandemic uh, and uh, all kind of things you have also mm -hmm. like in the same time you have this contradiction that nation state is back in mm -hmm. politics so this is like very uh, interesting uh, contradiction which is going on mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I mean the question is uh, when it comes to media and when it comes to all kind of these uh, aspects, the question is uh, of the analysis of it, and I think uh, you should continue doing it, uh, and let's uh, meet in another episode, so to say. That is uh, my, our hello to both of you. Uh, you, you yes, yeah, hello, goodbye. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, good we, we um, yeah, that was a great talk. Yeah, of course, we should carry on and, and try and uh, Try and work out what what needs to be done. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, guys, and Adam, maybe you want to say something for the for end. the end. No, I no, I feel good about it all. I think that's a good spot to leave it. Honestly, um, it's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Cheers then. Thank you so very much, guys. So we say thank, bye. Thank again. you. Thank you so much. It was great, great to think together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good okay so that's the end um so yeah that was pretty good yeah yeah um
so it's going to be quite a long edit process um but i'll be in contact i mean do you want this whole file yourself you don't need no you don't need, you, don't no. need. you can no. you can cut it uh, you can decide yeah you can decide it because we are talking about it also so it's well, i think uh, kind mo of mo actually most of what we said should just stay in it's just a uh, i agree need to I replace replace those video or put that video in but then there's this long period of of there's nothing there except the icon of the yeah VL, uh, vlc was in the middle but you can put some image instead I yeah just if anyone has an idea adam maybe you can help me think later then or soon about what okay yeah but it was not so long you took this image later on and uh, it was well, for a certain while, when it doesn't matter, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, but we will find something, we can put something behind, yeah. um, behind everything. So, uh, that's fine, yeah, we'll do it. I mean, I guess it's going to be like, um, I don't know, two or three weeks before it goes oh, okay. up. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, see you, see you later and talk more about all this. Yes, okay, all right. thank you, yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Adam, Adam, I probably should we speak a bit more, Adam? Yeah, we can speak. Okay. I'll, I'll stop the recording. Uh, okay, so. Okay, bye bye. Bye.